Hi, I released this video back on April 10th, 2024, and uh, Warner Brothers decided to copyright strike me. I don't want to have that on the channel, so this is an edited version of that, just in case you're wondering why you feel like you've already seen this video. So with that out of the way, let's get into it. Do that for the audience retention. Let's just lay it all out there. I was five years old when the 2005 Charlie and the Chocolate Factory came out. Uh, needless to say, this brain was smooth, barely developed. But even still, the masterpiece that is this movie found one little wrinkle to sink itself deep into. After a recent watch through, I can say that this movie altered my brain chemistry. There are so many scenes and jokes and mannerisms that I picked up from this film, and it was extremely fun going back and having what felt like old light bulbs go off in my head during these scenes. I'm sure I don't have to do much explaining, but Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was a film released in July of 2005 that was based off the novel of the same name released in 1964. Tim Burton directed this film while also working on another small indie film of his, I'm sure that you have not heard of it in all honesty, um, something called Corpse Bride. So uh, yeah, not important to the setup, just thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, but anyway, there was honestly a little bit of a tumultuous come up story for this film considering development started in 1991. Many different people had their hands in the mix during this time until Burton was finally settled on as a director. There were also many actors who were in the running for portraying Wonka himself such as Nick Cage, Jim Carrey, Will Smith, and even Adam Sandler. Burton ended up choosing Johnny Depp to portray Wonka due to him working so well with him in the past. While there is a fair amount of CGI in the film, most set pieces and effect were practical in nature such as the Chocolate River and Waterfall. Crazy, I know, but the river consisted of what ended up being 1.25 million liters of artificial chocolate produced by the Vickers Lab in the UK. Deep Roy also needs to be given his flowers because of the crazy amount of work he put into portraying the Oompa Loompas on set. There were scenarios where puppets were used such as the boat scene and CGI here and there, but most appearances of Deep Roy were shot and spliced in. Deep had to stay on a pretty strict diet throughout filming to stay at 74 pounds and even learned to play some instruments for the rock scene we'll see later on in the video. By the end of filming, Deep ended up playing the role of 165 Oompa Loompas, which is a crazy amount when he originally signed on for just 5. I could go on about the effects, but that's kind of a video all on its own. I just wanted to point it out because it really shows like all the love and effort that went into making this movie. But anyway, uh, nostalgia for the movie aside, let's take a look at Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. The movie opens up with some sweeping shots of the factory and takes us into the Wonka bar making process. We see a purple gloved hand gently placing five golden tickets on the back of Wonka bars before they're sent off to be wrapped. Uh, this ticket seems to be an invitation of some sort with the text telling the recipient to appear at the front gates of the factory at a specific date and time. We see the Wonka fleet making their way out of the factory into the wilds of nondescript British US Canadian town. No for real, that isn't a joke. There's a lot of British accents in the film, yet currency is referred to as dollars, or even the chocolate being referred to as candy bars, uh, both which is Americanized vernacular. Um, there's actually a fan theory from Chocolate Lover 82 over on r slash fan theories that puts the factory in a desolate Canadian town whose residents still retain their British accent. Uh, pause the video for a second if you'd like to read it because it is pretty interesting. Anyway, we begin to learn about Charlie and the living situation he's in with his family of seven. They aren't very well off by any means, seemingly eating cabbage soup for most of their meals, uh, with full woolen outfits on to stay warm inside their own house. Uh, Charlie's dad gifts Charlie with some misshapen toothpaste caps from the factory he works at, and Charlie shows off his sick modeling skills by pulling out a full replica of the chocolate factory made entirely out of said caps. The model factory leads Grandpa Joe down memory lane as he reminisces about how he used to work with Wonka years ago. We get to see the opening of the factory 15 years before and even get a story about an Indian prince who commissions Wonka to build a palace entirely out of chocolate. Uh, clearly this isn't the best idea and Wonka isn't able to help build another due to him dealing with his secrets being sold by a person on the inside. Suddenly rival candy businesses are selling whimsical candies based off of Wonka's ideas which makes Wonka choose to close his gates and fire his team of workers. 
Charlie points out that the factory is still in business though and produces candy and his family points out the mystery of what is going on in there because Wonka never hired any of his workers back. The family heads to bed after this discussion and we see Wonka couriers placing papers around town in the middle of the night explaining what those tickets are from the beginning of the film. Wonka is opening his gates again baby! He states that he's allowing five children from around the world into his factory and even a mysterious grand prize for one of the kids. All they need is that golden ticket to be allowed in. The search is on for these tickets and we see mobs of people buying Wonka bars all over the world. Charlie and Grandpa Joe talk about how exciting it is and how he could possibly get a ticket and Charlie mentions that he's only allowed one single bar for his birthday a year. That seems to put a little bit of a wrench into things, but Charlie stays hopeful. And not even a day into the search, we have the first ticket found over in Dusseldorf, Germany. Augustus Gloop uh, talks to news reporters about how he chomped into the bar and tasted something that wasn't candy at all. He celebrates by cracking open another cold one. The second ticket is found in Buckinghamshire, England by the Salt family, an extremely uppity and aristocratic family who owns a nut factory. They have purchased an extremely large stock of Wonka bars and have their team of nutcrackers unwrap thousands of bars. It takes three whole days of unwrapping until they finally find a ticket. Veruca's actress also does an amazing job of being absolutely insufferable here and throughout the rest of the movie. <laughs> we cut back to Charlie's house and he's being given his annual Wonka bar for his birthday and no whammies, no whammies. It's chocolate. Delectable chocolate, of course, but no ticket. Charlie takes it like a champ and shares his bar with his family in a very touching scene. Charlie brings home a discarded newspaper and they get to read about the third ticket holder from Atlanta, Georgia, Miss Violet Beauregard, a cutthroat competitive 10 year old spawned from the crushed dreams of her mother. Dropping the guys for a second, I can't help but feel extremely bad for kids who are raised like this. Uh, I'm extremely lucky that my parents never forced me into sports or any type of competition scenes while growing up because I'm sure it would have made my anxiety and perfectionism even worse than it is today. I see you guys. I see you and I hope you're doing okay in your adult lives. <laughs> The fourth ticket has already been claimed by Mike TV in Denver, Colorado. Uh, the gamer type with brain rots at levels never seen before, especially in 2005. He explains that he used manufacturing dates and a Tokyo stock exchange uh, to pinpoint which chocolate bars had a golden ticket, uh, boasting that he only bought one. I'm not exactly sure how that's possible. But I am not the expert here and cannot talk about the validity of that. With only one ticket left, hope is almost completely out the window and we find out that Charlie's dad was laid off from the toothpaste factory being replaced by a more efficient machine. Grandpa Joe taps into his savings and gives Charlie enough for just one more chocolate bar. That thread of hope Charlie is holding on to rests on this one singular chocolate bar and snip is gone. Charlie accepts his dashed dreams and treks out to give the factory a good look down. But what's that? A snowy tin? Fresh? Mint? Wait, we have a chance, brother. Lo and behold, it happens. Charlie becomes the official holder of the last ticket and rushes home to share the joy with his family. Grandpa Joe is filled with childlike wonder and gives us a little jig volunteering to take Charlie to the factory himself. Charlie promptly ruins the mood by stating that he will sell the ticket. Uh, to help the family out. Boo, fiscal responsibility, get him out of here, what a loser. His family knocks some sense back into him, stating that the ticket is almost priceless due to it being such a once in a lifetime opportunity. And just like that, we arrive on the factory on the big day. The group looks each other up and down and are allowed into the gates, uh, being met with an abandoned at Disney's-esque animatronic show. After they sing the praises of Wonka, it quickly devolves into chaos with the sparkler effect catching the set and puppets on fire. After the scene is over, uh, Wonka claps his hands giddily, stating that he worried about the energy in the middle part, but the finale gave it that wow factor it needed. This is actually the first time that we get to see who uh, the character of Willy Wonka is, um, an extremely eccentric, misunderstood figure who finds joy in the strange. I absolutely love this portrayal of Wonka. He's full of nervous energy, feeling like he's thinking and rethinking the words he's saying, and even resorts to flashcards to help him talk to the group. Veruca mentions that if you're Wonka, shouldn't you have been on the throne of the display? And he retorts explaining that if he was up there, he couldn't watch the show. 
I guess I love this version so much because I feel so seen in this character, which probably isn't the best thing, but hey, you don't get to choose the characters that change your brain chemistry. They choose you. <laughs> Wonka ushers them into the factory and is pointed out how the factory is pretty warm. Uh, Wonka explains that his workers are used to a very hot climate and prefers the warmth. Also, uh, this happens with Violet, which I think is hilarious. Everyone else introduces themselves and we see that Wonka has trouble getting the word parent out, sending him into a spiral of thoughts. A very light way of showing us that he has some familial issues. I'm sure you missed it on your first watch. That's what I'm here for. Also, I know I'm going a little bit slow. We'll speed it up. But this interaction between Charlie and Augustus just gets under my skin. Why are kids so damn mean? I never in my life would think to say something so out of the way to somebody. Like, even as a kid. Um, some of y'all weren't raised by Canadian cartoons. And it shows. After making their way through an ever-narrowing corridor, Wonka pushes open the doors to his candy pastures. There are many sights to see in this room, and Wonka assures the kids that everything here is edible. Wonka sends them on their way in the pasture to enjoy some of what the room has to offer, and enjoy can mean a lot of things very clearly. Veruca Salt notices a worker on the other side of the room and inquires about who he is. Wonka explains that he's a worker called an Oompa Loompa from the dangerous jungles of Loompa Land, giving us a flashback to the night Wonka met them. He was just in the neighborhood looking for some exotic taste when he stumbled upon their tree houses. Uh, they welcomed him with open arms and a very viscous blend of caterpillars. The Oompa Loompas search out for as many cocoa beans as possible. Uh, but they don't find very many, so Wonka makes a deal with them to work at his factory for all the cocoa beans that they could want. Strange implications aside, uh, we see Augustus going to town on the Chocolate River. Not heeding any warnings, uh, he falls in and begins to get sucked up by an extraction pipe. We get to see a bit of Wonka's psyche in this moment, because as the pipe begins to move into place, we see almost excitement on Wonka's face, quietly watching the scene unfold before him. This continues as he proudly looks upon Augustus firmly planted in the tube. This begins a series of events that made me want to make this video. Charlie points out the Oompa Loompas all begin to follow a rhythm as we begin to hear a song swell in the background. Veruca asks what they're doing and Wonka whimsically says that they're going to be treated to a song, hence such a grand occasion. All the Oompa Loompas begin to take their places throughout the Candy Hills and sing the demise of good old Gloop. I'm gonna have to start a tier list, aren't I? Alright, pull it up for the retention. This is the first song that we get from the Loompas, and it's a great one to start off with. It has a bit of a pep rally feel, almost like a high school marching band is putting it on, getting the energy going. There's a bit of synchronized swimming, group dance ensembles, and harmonies all throughout the song. Uh, like I said, it's a great start to the songs, and it's kind of the first time that we get a look into what this movie is going to be like and has in store for us for the last hour of the film. We'll give the good old Gloopster an A. The group mentions that the song felt rehearsed like they knew it was going to happen, but Wonka quickly disregards this and moves forward, asking Alumpa to take Augustus' mom to the fudge room to try and locate Augustus. I don't know if Loompa is a derogatory term. I feel wrong saying it. I'd like to uh, formally apologize to the Loompa community if it is derogatory. I promise you it comes from a place of ignorance. A group of Loompas begin to row a giant candy boat up to the group and Wonka ushers them on board. As they ride down the chocolate river, Charlie asks Wonka if he remembers what it was like being a kid. This sends Wonka into an a thousand yard stare as we get flashbacks to his troubled childhood, specifically on Halloween night. We come to find out that he's the son of Wilbur Wonka, an esteemed dentist in their town. Wonka has a wicked set of headgear on for his braces and is forced to empty his trick-or-treat bag out for his dad, who berates him on the unforgivable act of bringing home candy. Wonka tries his best to plead with his dad, asking for just one piece of chocolate, 
but it's all for naught as Wilbur takes all of the candy and chucks it into the fireplace. Charlie snaps us back into reality, alerting Wonka of an upcoming tunnel. Wonka then asks for full speed ahead as we're taking through the chocolate underbelly of the factory seeing other production rooms. After some Olympic level rowing, the Olympus take us to the quote, most important room of the factory. Wonka shows us a few of his specialized candies like the Everlasting Gobstoppers and Hair Toffee. Bit of a strange name, I wonder what it... Oh. Gotcha. This room is going to give us the next damning piece of candy for one of the group, uh, the three course stick of gum. Wonka pulls out some flashcards again to explain the wonders of the gum, and we come to find out that it offers a taste of an entire three-course meal, starting with an appetizer and ending with dessert. Violet being, one, the way she is, and two, a chewing gum world record holder, snatches the stick of gum and quickly starts chewing away, ignoring the warnings of both the group and Wonka. This one stuck with me as a kid because Violet explicitly states that she can feel the tomato soup going down her throat and that never left my brain as a kid. Could you genuinely imagine chewing a piece of gum and feeling hearty tomato soup going down your throat? That is disgusting to me. I am so sorry, but that is disgusting. Violet is going through the rest of the flavors of the gum as the group starts to notice a blue tinge start to appear on Violet's nose. This transformation gets exponentially worse and Violet begins expanding, resembling that of a blueberry, the last flavor of the three-course meal. God, it feels so weird to be seeing these scenes as an adult and knowing about certain fetishes. Mainly why I said expanding and not the other word. Wonka once again just lets the scene play out with nothing he can really do, and we get one of the best clips from the movie with this. But I can't have a blueberry as a daughter. How is she supposed to compete? You could put you in a county fair. Uh, we start to hear music swell in the background again as some sleek, silver-suited Loompas come out and treat us to another song. God, I finally get to say this song alone was the reason I wanted to make this video. The Violet song goes incredibly hard for no reason. Rent was due, lights were turned off, gas tank was empty, money had to be made on this one. I am sorry about Pebbles. Pebbles is my neighbor's dog and you're going to hear him barking throughout this video. I'm sorry. He's cute. If you could see him, you wouldn't be upset. This song gives us funky guitars, soulful keyboards, oompa chanting, and an extremely upbeat tone. This one is S tier for sure. I'm genuinely not able to just say how good this is. Uh, if you have the time, please go check this scene out on YouTube. It's an incredible scene and an amazing send off for Violet. Wonka then has the Loompas take Violet's mom down to the juicing room, and Wonka ushers the group again by saying, I don't know what he says. See, this is why you need to make your video when you write the script. I have no idea what he says to the group. I can't even joke on it. Come on. Let's boogie. The kids ask a few questions on the way to their next destination while Charlie triggers another flashback by asking Wonka if he remembers his first piece of candy. Cut back to a younger Wonka cleaning out the fireplace as he notices one singular piece of chocolate left untouched by the flames, and he quickly stuffs it past his headgear. Brother man is zooted. We see this cause a spiral for Wonka, getting his hands on as much candy as possible to write down their flavor profiles and learn more about the candy he is so heavily barred from. The shelling room is next up for the group, and we see a bunch of squirrels lined up around a circular floor having their go at a bunch of nuts. Bad nuts get the void. Vruka's dad asks Wonka why he uses squirrels and not the Loompas, and Wonka quickly explains how efficient squirrels are at the job. This is also somewhat of a practical effect, which is pretty cool. Some of the squirrels are static puppets, but a few of the ones shown up close were trained from birth for the role. Vruka then gets a glint in her eye and begins begging for one of the trained squirrels. Wonka shuts this down, but Veruca has already made her mind up and slides through the gate to get a squirrel one way or the other. I'm sure we see where this is going. Veruca ignores both her dad and Wonka as she continues to find the one that she likes best, and we see her eyes land on her pick. The squirrels all stand on guard, and as soon as Veruca reaches out, all hell breaks loose. 
They swarm her and begin the process that they were trained for. While she's stretched out on the ground, one squirrel hops up and gives Veruca three good taps to see if she's a bad nut. The verdict is out and Veruca is in fact a bad nut. Veruca's punishment? The void. The hole is connected to the incinerator, which luckily only gets lit on Tuesdays. Today is Tuesday. Well, shit. As Veruca's dad climbs down into the room, some Kill Bill looking Loompas come out and begin our next send off song. This one is a bit of a more psychedelic type sound with a very flowy tone and choreography that matches it to a T. They sing about all the trash items that have been thrown down into the incinerator and how Veruca will have quite a different set of friends. Sitar sounds and tambourines can be heard throughout the song and it ends with the squirrel putting the quite literal pushover dad out of his misery. Not the best song, but still pretty good. We'll give it a B. Oh, the incinerator's broke? Oh, okay. Worm. Worm. Wonka gathers what's left of the group into the factory's glass elevator, explaining just how efficient it is. While descending the, uh, target practice room, Mike triggers another flashback for Wonka by saying how much of a waste of time chocolate is. We see Wonka standing up for his desire to become a chocolatier, and this causes strife between both him and his dad. Wonka states that he will run away and travel the world seeking new flavors of candy, and we see this play out in a bit of a short scene. Oh, well, I'm sure he'll get to it. Wonka's dad said that he wouldn't be there when he came back, and he actually stood on business with it. <laughs> Getting back to the elevator, Mike demands he wants to pick a room, and of course he chooses the TV room. The TV room is much smaller compared to the rooms that we've seen so far, and is very sterile with the whole room being enveloped in white. Wonka talks about his idea of transporting candy into TV sets the same way shows and movies are. Mike argues with the idea a bit, explaining how they're two different mediums with Quon with Quonka. Quonka. Mike argues with the idea a bit, explaining how they're two different mediums, but Wonka quickly shuts this down. They prepare the transporter loading up a giant bar of chocolate, explaining it must be large because TV makes you lose so much size. After it gets zapped, the crew rushes over to the TV and it in fact emerges into the set of Planet of the Apes. Small, just like Wonka said it would be. Charlie reaches out and grabs the chocolate bar straight out of the TV and gives it a try, commenting that it's great. Wonka pitches the idea again like it's a board meeting, and this causes the group to question what else could be sent. Mike goes a bit rogue, saying how foolish Wonka is being with this technology, pointing out that he made a literal teleporter, and chooses himself to be the first person sent into TV. He rushes onto the teleporter pad, pressing the start button before taking the jump, and slowly levitates on the pad while the technology goes into place. They rush to the TV again, waiting for the signal to come in, and as a drum line begins to swell, we see Mike phase into a news reporter scene. This song is a very high-paced rock song that talks about the plights of placing a kid in front of the TV at a young age and what it can do to a mind. We see Mike get thrown into many TV tropes such as advertisements, a cooking show, a music video, and even a psycho reference. The Loompas and the TV are mostly performing the song, but the Loompas and the room give us a stellar background dance during it. Uh, while this one is okay, it does feel a bit rushed and the message is a bit contrived. We'll give this one a B. Just like the chocolate, Mike has been shrunk down immensely. Once he gets pulled out of the TV, Wonka states that he'll have to be taken to the taffy puller to get him back into shape, mentioning just how springy young boys are. Wonka continues by heading back to the elevator asking how many kids were left for the tour. Charlie's grandpa states that Charlie is the only one left and this makes Wonka extremely excited, stating that Charlie has won and that they have much left to do before the day is up. He gets back onto the ele- Ooh. Ooh. Now he gets back onto the elevator and presses the up and out button, making Charlie ask exactly what that means. 
Charlie quickly finds out what it means as they spiral through the air. Wonka presses a button and turns on the elevator's jets to hover wherever they need to go. We get to see the other kids leaving the factory, all dealing with their given fates. Augustus and Veruca got out of the factory pretty much unscathed, but Violet and Mike sadly have a bit more to deal with. Wonka asks Charlie where he lives, and we see Wonka absolutely eviscerate the family's home. Wonka drops the news that Charlie won the entire factory, and the family is in disbelief. Wonka explains that a single piece of gray hair is what made him want to find an heir to his chocolate empire, and Charlie quickly agrees, but only on the premise that his family could come with him. Wonka playfully laughs it off, stating that his family couldn't come, which causes Charlie to back out of the deal. Charlie states that he wouldn't give up his family for all the chocolate in the world, which confuses Wonka, reminding Charlie that there's more candy than just chocolate. Charlie holds his ground and Wonka leaves, confused and dejected. We see Charlie's family starting to live a much better life due to his father becoming a technician of the same robot that had gotten him fired earlier in the film. Wonka though was left in the dark from this experience trying to find the answers to his unhappiness. He seems to track down Charlie again, a bit strange, to find his answers that he's looking for, asking Charlie what made him feel better when he's down. He quickly answers that his family is what makes him feel better. Wonka states that he just doesn't understand that because all family does is tell you what to do, what not to do, when to do it, when not to do it, and how bad it is for your mental and creative processes. Charlie retorts that they're just doing what they can to help and protect you out of love, challenging Wonka to ask if he doesn't believe him. Wonka laughs this off, asking if he's genuinely telling him to go talk to his dad. Charlie recognizes Wonka's anxieties regarding the situation and tells him that he'll travel with him if it'll help. Wonka says that this is a great idea and quickly, uh, quickly gets back onto his elevator. They land in a snowy field with just one singular building smack dab in the middle. Charlie rings the buzzer and Wilbur answers, asking if they have an appointment. Charlie states no, but that he's overdue. Charlie takes a look around the room and we see multiple framed newspaper clippings keeping up with the status of Wonka's empire throughout the years, showing that Charlie was right on the money with what he said. Wilbur is enamored with Wonka's teeth, perfect to a T, and recognizes Willie in an extremely heart-tugging scene. He says, After all these years, and you never flossed. Willie answers, not once, and they hold each other in an embrace. The narrator informs us that Willie offered Charlie the factory again, and he agrees on the condition that his family can move into the factory with him and take Wonka in as one of their own. The closing scene shows the family sitting down for dinner with Wonka and Charlie joining them. The camera pans out and shows that they have rebuilt their home on top of the candy pastures that we saw at the beginning of the movie. A great conclusion to the events that have unfolded throughout the movie. There's a lot to talk about when it comes to the 2005 Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie, with a lot of nuanced scenes and dynamics throughout. I honestly have only scraped the surface of the theme of this movie, but there are a lot of videos out there that talk about the deeper meaning in scenes that are really worth checking out. Rewatching this movie as an adult made me realize just how good the theme of family was for people who felt a bit ostracized in their own birth families, and honestly helped me out even now while writing the script. In some scenarios, yes, it is completely understandable to cut family out if you feel like it's best for you, but sometimes you just have to realize that no parents are perfect and they do what they can just for you and them to get by. Don't hold grudges about small things with family because you never know when you might lose them. Some of us don't realize that until it's too late, sadly. Like I said, there's a lot of nuanced scenes with the family dynamics of all the kids and how their parents' actions shape their kids, but all of those are videos on their own. It was really fun taking a look back at such a great movie from my childhood and I hope you enjoyed your time with me as well. If you have the chance, you really should go back and watch both this one and the 1971 Charlie and the Chocolate Factory because they are both extremely funny and are still very entertaining to this day. Do you have any fun memories surrounding this movie? If you did, let me know down below and make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed it. If you want to see more from me, feel free to check out my other videos on the channel. And if you'd like to catch me live, make sure to subscribe and turn on that bell notification to get notified whenever I post or go live. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to check me out, and be good to yourself. Bye-bye!